Hello and welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Monday, March 7th, 2022. I'm Maggie Lake here with William Browder, the CEO of Hermitage Capital. Bill, thanks so much for being here with us. Great to be here. Uh, the global economy, you know, continues to reel uh, from the crisis in Ukraine. Oil surged again. We had nickel up an astounding 60% today, right? Wheat is limited up another 7%. U.S. equities um, closing at their lows. As we close trade, just happening um, at this moment on the lows of the day. Um, so you know, investors really trying to wrap their head around this. Um, I just want to, before we dive in, for those, many, many of our viewers know you well, but for those who are not familiar with your background, your firm really made its reputation by uh, uncovering the corruption at Russian firms. You personally became a target as a result. You were banned from the country. The lawyer that worked for you, Sergei Magnitsky, was arrested, died in custody in Russia. You sought justice for him, got the Magnitsky Act passed against a lot of odds, and have really been, you know, toe to toe with Putin for what the better part of 15 years now. So I can't think of a more perfect person to sit down with at this moment. What do you think the mindset, what do we need to understand about the mindset of Putin at this very critical juncture? Well, so Putin has been a dictator for 22 years. Um, he's been a dictator who's stolen an enormous amount of money from the Russian people. Um, I guess it's well north of $200 billion. Uh, that's money that should have gone to hospitals and schools and filling in potholes and roads and so on and so forth. And so after 22 years, people are kind of tired of him. And uh, uh, and he's watched other countries around him have, uh, the dictators in those countries have, have, have a problem. He saw Lukashenko, who is the dictator of Belarus, has been there for a few more years than him, almost lose his, his position because people rose up after a fraudulent election. Uh, he saw the uh, Nazarbayev, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who was the dictator of Kazakhstan, getting washed out after uh, gas prices went up uh, dramatically and huge protests across the country. And so Putin is a guy who uh, you know sees risk and understands risk. And he says to himself, he um, doesn't want to be sitting, sitting duck waiting for it to happen. And so what does a dictator do in a situation like that? He digs into the dictator's playbook and he starts a war. That's that's what this is about. A lot of people say this war is about, you know, NATO enlargement. They say this war is about um, Ukraine democracy. And, you know, th those are things that probably upset Putin. But the, the, the principal driving factor of Putin going to war in Ukraine and why he's doing it now is that he's a, a washed out dictator who's afraid of getting overthrown and he needs to find a way of distracting his people and creating a crisis. And that's what this war is all about. And it's important to understand that because if you understand that, then, then we can start to think about what are the, what are the tools, what, where's the leverage to, um, to either stop him, slow him down or change his behavior in some way. Yeah. And that leverage presumably is money. I mean, that's certainly the tool that, that, it has been used from the playbook so far. Does it seem like it's working? Well, it's it's um it's it's important to understand who Putin is as a character, and um, he's not a guy who ever um, can reverse. You know, there's no reverse gear in Vladimir Putin. All he can do is go forward. And so, um, when we we can never expect, no matter what the sanctions are, no matter what the military situation is. For him to say, uh "Oh, I'm uh, okay. Cease fire. Let's negotiate." That's just not who Vladimir Putin is. He comes from a sort of prison yard mentality where it's always, uh, you know, escalate, escalate, escalate. Show that he's the meanest prisoner in the prison yard. He's ready to take his knife out and shank anyone who comes anywhere near him. That that's his psychology. So um, he's never going to back down or negotiate. And so when we think about what's what what would work and what wouldn't work at this point. Now that he's invaded, it's all about making it impossible for him to carry on going forward by depleting his resources. Hmm. Uh, this is a very expensive war, and um, it requires a lot of money, and we need to impose absolute crippling sanctions. I would I would describe it as what we need is a total economic blockade, so that he ev eventually runs out of money. And he doesn't have enough money to execute the war. So if you knew, use the car analogy where he, he can't go in re reverse, he can only go forward. We want the car to splutter out because it's run out of gas. And, and that is, in my mind, 
the only thing that's going to stop Vladimir Putin from uh, taking over Ukraine and then further uh, challenging us at a uh, NATO neighboring border like Estonia, Lithuania, or Latvia. And so, uh, you know, certainly the the West has moved quickly on sanctions, maybe more quickly than Vladimir Putin thought they would. There seems to be a lot of cohesion, but has it gone far enough? I mean, would it, it, it certainly there's carve outs for oil and gas, there's carve outs for companies, that, Russia, big producer of nickel, those are carved out. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of conversation about that today as we've watched nickel prices soar 60%. So not only are they not carved out, but there's been a huge increase, um, you know, in those metals. Does is that what needs to happen? Does it need to be absolute? And what are the prospects of that? Um, well, the prospects change every day as he commits more atrocities, and the world watches them, and, and the world understands that um, this is, you know, this is like a, a World War II um, Hitler, early World War II Hitler type of situation where. Um, we're watching on on the television, you know, the humanitarian disaster that he's executed playing out in real time. And and so I, I do think that as this thing gets worse and worse, the sanctions will get tougher and tougher. Um, at the moment, only 70 percent of um, the banks are disconnected from SWIFT. And that's kind of a meaningless uh, uh, punishment because the other 30 percent of the banks can handle the transactions that the 70 percent of the banks used to handle if necessary. Um, we've we've sanctioned the um, uh, roughly a dozen oligarchs. We need to sanction a hundred oligarchs, and and probably uh, we need to say no more Russian oil. We'll we'll find oil elsewhere. And uh, I think if we do that, then he really is in a terrible terrible position. And and you know you can see it right now. The the Russian stock market is down like ninety five percent. And and for what it's worth, I. I uh, if if they don't ever get access to capital again, um, there'll be so many defaults that the equity will be worthless in a lot of companies. Uh, you have the the ruble down forty percent. It's it's really a quite dramatic situation, more more dramatic than anything I've ever seen in in my professional lifetime. Yeah, and we're gonna and we're gonna get to the the you know the the, the risks around that as well. But um, it's it seems to be that there is uh, some of some of this is happening through self sanctions. This is a, a, a term that's been 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 called that, uh, that although countries themselves haven't banned, certainly this is happening on the energy market, haven't banned oil or gas, everyone's afraid to touch it because it might be, and then they'll be stuck with it. Is, is that giving the same effect or does it need to come from the countries themselves, first of all? No, this is very dramatic. I, I, the the idea that, that just about every foreign company doesn't want to do business with um, Russia um, totally elevates the the level of economic pain that's being inflicted, and so if you have, um, I've heard these stories about um, uh, no, there's no uh, transportation companies that want to take any Russian oil, even even if Russian oil hasn't been sanctioned, because they don't want to be in a position where they picked up some Russian oil, they they go ten ten days to some other place and then they can't unload it, and so hmm. better just to avoid it altogether. And and I would imagine that that's the same across the board with. With almost everything, and and on top of that, you have all these. You know, there's no more. You can't fly from Russia to anywhere. The, the, the entire Aeroflot um, fleet has been grounded, and it's um, it's really just a, a, a you know in, at this point almost total economic blockade. But there still needs to be more done, and and if more is done, I, I, I do think that Vladimir Putin is is going to be in a, an extremely precarious position because. This war that he's waging is an extremely expensive operation. It's costing billions, a dollar, billions of dollars a day, and um, it, it carries on and it carries on and carries on. We're on twelfth day, and um, he doesn't have access to, to much cash anymore. His central bank reserves in, in all hard currency is frozen. Now, eventually, he's going to go to the Chinese and say, "I need some money," and the Chinese are going to lick their lips and say, "Okay, um, you, we'll give you some money." And it'll be like borrowing on a credit card, borrowing money on a credit card where he can, you know, he has to like pledge all sorts of assets that he never intended to pledge and, and so on and so forth. But I but I do think he's going to run out of money. And at that point, um, it becomes a very interesting situation. How does he handle it from there? Yeah. So, you know, if if, if he's attempting to stay in power, if this if this if he's motivated by what you think he is, 
Does the pain inflicted on the Russian people work in the favor of seeing him overthrown, or does it dig in and they feel victimized by the West, um, and it solidifies power around him? Well, I mean, he's hoping for the for the latter. Um, we're hoping for the former. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, th- th- there, there's there, there's a total misconception inside of Russia of what what's going on. The most Russian people think that there's no invasion, there's no war. There's some kind of limited special operation going on to free Ukraine from Nazi occupation. And it's like a humanitarian um, intervention from the Russian people's perspective, because that's what that's the propaganda uh, that they're fed. And so in some in some cases, they may start to, um, you know, be mad at the West. And and that's certainly, um, uh, you know, that's certainly his his calculation. But I, I think that and I saw some some clips of of Russian people demonstrating not for or against the war, but against higher prices. And um, mm. uh, I was just listening to Gary Kasparov, the grandmaster chess champion, talking about this. And, and he says sometimes the uh, the, fr- the the fridge um, outweighs the television. Yeah, that's a great line. And, and so true. But we're feeling it, too. So at some point, it's a game of attrition and who can tolerate the discomfort and and the higher prices for longer although you know given the 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 sanctions we've seen it's going to be a lot more painful for for people in Russia um is there an apparatus uh, so the russian the ordinary russian person may not know what's going on but the oligarchs so, certainly do they certainly know what's happening uh even even if they are in russia and and are somewhat limited by by the information they're able to access um is there an apparatus where do you think their head is? Is there an apparatus to begin to think about replacing Putin? How loyal are they still to him? Well, so the the oligarchs um, are there at his pleasure. In other words, at any moment, he can take away their wealth, put them in jail, or kill them. So they're all terrified of him, and um, they know exactly what's going on. Their wealth has been decimated, wiped out by ninety percent or more, and so the, uh, you know whatever they own in Russia is down ninety five percent. And whatever they own in the West either has been frozen or will be frozen. So it's, it's a disaster for them. I mean, it's, it's an unmitigated existential disaster for them. And these are people who, are, who don't value anything but money. I mean, it's, it's just the worst thing that could have ever happened. But at the same time, they also understand that um, if they speak any kind of disloyal statement about Putin, even privately to another oligarch, and it gets back to Putin, he might just take them out right then and there because he's afraid. You know, if we're talking about this, I guarantee you that Putin is thinking about it. And if he's thinking about disloyalty and betrayal, he's going to go out and look for it and fr- try to figure out who might be in that camp. And, and uh, you know, I, we've seen this, the, the, the way in which people are afraid of him. There was this meeting he had with his National Security Council where he was like the head of his um, uh, uh, head of the foreign intelligence um, was uh, what, what, or military intelligence was the guy who, like, you know, pokes people's eyeballs out with his bare hands um, was was you know quaking like a small school child in front of Putin. I mean this, this is this is how scared he has his people. And so I wouldn't be um, imagining that there's going to be any oligarch uprising. And I, I I also don't think in the short term anyways that that the people will, will rise up not because they're not they're not happy or they're not unhappy that they're not going to rise up because they're so scared. Anytime any person goes out and demonstrates they get arrested. And um, there's these rumors that the peace, the peace protesters are going to be the first people to be drafted when they declare martial law and sent to the front line. And so, I mean, he's a brutal, vicious, sadistic man. And it's, it takes incredible um, bravery to stand up against him. And, and yes, if everybody stood up against him together, they could, they could you know, he'd be gone in a day. But um, nobody, you know, if, if you show up and nobody else shows up, then you're gone in a day. Yeah, it, that, that that is when you live in a in a you know in fear like that. It, it's very hard to. Uh, it's very easy to say rise up. It's a, quite another thing to see it happen in real time. Um, you know, when we're talking about the the possibility of a complete economic uh, blockade, uh, and especially looking at the metals market today because of what's going on, Wall Street Journal had a, a very uh, interesting <coughs> raised a very interesting question in one of his one of their articles. Are these companies simply too big? too important to the global economy to fail or to strangle to death by that kind of sanctions? 
Well, I, I think the answer is, uh, in some cases, these companies are too important in the um, global economic community um, to cut off completely. I mean, it, it, you know, if, if you have major commodity producers um, and you change the supply situation for these commodities, then of course they're going to have uh, a massive dislocation. And we saw this before. Back in 2018, um, uh, Oleg Deripaska, who's one of the biggest oligarchs, was sanctioned um, by the U.S. for his involvement or being for his proximity and involvement uh, with Putin and Putin's involvement in hacking the elections of 2016. And this set the aluminum markets in a total uh, uh, frenzy. And eventually they had to unsanction his company because um, it was just too important in the, in the big picture. And, um, you know, I imagine that there will be a lot of discussions about that around the world in the next weeks and months. But um, at the same time, uh, we're also facing a, an unbelievably dangerous situation. I mean, there's, you know, nuclear, they're bombing nuclear power plants. Mm. He's threatening nuclear war. Um, he's threatening anybody, he's threatening war to anybody who gets involved in helping the Ukrainians in their military defense. It's, this is a very dangerous situation. I mean, I can't overstate how dangerous it is. And, and I don't think that we should even be talking about money when we're talking about yeah. the survival of the planet. I mean, it, we, you know, we, we if, if Putin goes the way that he could go, and by the way, he always does things worse than people expect. That's been my whole experience with him over, over 15 years of fighting with him. And so we need to really um, be careful um, and prepared to try to do whatever we have to do. The only thing we should be maximizing on is, or maybe I think minimizing on, is allowing, minimize his ability to carry on with this military adventure because the, con the consequences are just so horrific uh, if, if this thing goes in the wrong direction that, that it could truly be, uh, you know, and lights out for, for the world. Yeah. I mean, it's well put. It's hard to imagine that we're having this conversation, but I think that people try to sort of put a rational view on it and leave room for an off ramp or negotiations. And from what you know of him, that's just not going to happen. Uh, yes. There is no de escalation in his worldview. There, it's not possible. He's never, ever done it in my entire experience with him. And he tends to do these, these things that appear irrational, where he will cost himself enormous amounts of money, respect, connections, whatever. And this is long before he invaded Ukraine um, in other situations, just to show that he's that, you know, that, that you can't get the better of him. That's how he thinks. And so the only thing that we the only tool we really have is just to make it impossible for him to continue this war because he doesn't have the resources to. Right. No matter what the short term cost to the rest of us. I, I want to play um, Rob Powell. Uh, sent a, thinking about these, as we all try to wrap our head around this, sent a macro flash update today. Um, and I'd like to play a clip about the risks that he's thinking about in this ripple effect. Let's have a listen. If Russia remains out of the global system, which looks increasingly likely, then we probably have a big liquidity problem. And that spits around the world in various ways, whether it's countries who are trying to get access to dollars, banks trying to get access to dollars, um, or whether it's credit spreads widening as people pull back, trying to assess the risks that are going on. And we don't really know. I mean, how does it affect Egypt? How does it affect the Middle East at large? How does it affect all sorts of countries? Again, we don't really know yet. But that's a hugely concerning moment, and that's a big global recession um, if that takes place and a massive monumental geopolitical shift. And Rouse full update is available across all tiers on the website. Um, Bill, is you know, ha, have you thought about this? Is is there a contagion risk from deplatforming Russia from the global system? Well, there, there's a contagion risk from everything that's going on right now. So let, let, let's just look at. So one of the things that that worries me the most, in addition to the higher energy prices, is the higher food prices. Um, mm. uh, Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world. Russia is a big grain producer. And so you have, um, and, and this is, you know, this, this will affect us to make it life inconvenient, more expensive, but there's a lot of um, uh, developing uh, countries around the world, poor countries around the world, where there, the people are, are, are on the verge of poverty, and this will stick them into starvation territory. And so I think one of the, the risks that nobody is even thinking about right now is all sorts of 
you know, revolutions and uprisings to, and to change of governments and, and uh, hugely horrible things going on in Africa and Latin America and Asia where we're not even paying any attention. And, and another um, contagion thing, which, which, um, which I think is really right in our face, the elephant in the room, is that uh, Putin loves to weaponize refugees. He did that with the um, Syrian war, where he basically created 5 million Syrian refugees, and they spread out across Europe, and that led to all sorts of change in politics and, and populist sentiment and, and uh, crazy people becoming uh, leaders of their countries. And we're now having a second refugee crisis. And this, is, this could be much, much bigger than the Syrian refugee crisis, where we're going to be talking about, um, you know, the, the, the prediction uh, for the UN is like 4 million refugees. I, you know, in a country of 40 million, 44 million people, I could imagine 10 million refugees. And that's a lot of people um, to be housed, um, you know, clothed, educated, and, and uh, you know, given health care all over Europe and all over the world, and and that could that that will change the politics. And then, of course, you have all these, you know, uh, knock-on effects like um, uh, you know with liquidity and markets and so on. You have all you, you'll have a lot of. I, I'm almost sure that because the Russian government can't get access to capital, and there's a sort of blockade for all these Russian companies, that a bunch of them, which are sort of ha have a, a positive net worth, will have insolvency because they can't get access to capital, and you'll end up with bankruptcies. I imagine that Putin will um, renationalize a lot of companies in order to get whatever economic benefit is left there. What does that do? And so it's, we're, we're, it, it's, it's all happened so fast and so dramatically that um, we're going to see all sorts of ricochets all different ways about this. But um, again, we should not lose sight of the fact that this is a war in, with a man who's got nuclear weapons who started threatening to use them a few days ago. And, and with that, I think everything else pales in comparison. Who do you think is the, the group that needs to be convinced to do a complete economic blockade? Who, who, are, who, are the, who, who, who is reluctant um, and maybe not calculating the risk properly? Well, I, I think there are certain people that just won't be able to participate. So if you're Italy, um, and and hundred percent of your gas comes from Russia, you're not going to be able to get involved or or that and you're not going to be able to get involved in that part. You're going to have to say, sorry, we're going to have to get our gas. Same thing with Austria, hundred um, percent. But you know with oil, oil is fungible. you know it, it's not like it has to come through a pipeline. I mean, it's some sometimes it does, but oil you can buy from lots of different people and places. And I think oil is easier to blockade. Um, and so the US is, I, by the way, the US, potential, you know, Iran talks going on and now opening diplomatic doors to Venezuela. Is yeah, that, I mean, does that seem like our, a, a good idea to replace the Russian oil uh, in that direction, as opposed to, say, ramp up production in the U.S.? Well, I think that we should ramp up production in the U.S. for sure. And the trouble with all these things is there's always these competing interests. So, you know, in Germany, um, uh, after Fukushima, they said, we don't want nuclear anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then they, they started get, taking more Russian gas. <laughs> And um, I mean, so, you know, we, we don't like Venezuela, but we don't even we don't like Russia even more. And, and so it's it's a um, it, it's a complicated situation. And I, I don't think there's a right answer to it. But but um, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, he's he's committed such a grave Putin's committed such a grave crime of basically tearing up the, the rule book after, you know, after the Second World War. And 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 his goal, in my opinion, is to go and, and stick his tanks on the border of Estonia and and say we're going to go in there and 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 point his missiles towards London and and Washington and and say, and say if you know are you ready to go to nuclear war with me over this and um he's hoping that we're going to um say you know the, the American people are going to say wait a second why are we going to nuclear war over a country that none of us can identify on a map and and uh, if and that's and he thinks he's right about that and and he might even be right about that uh, you know he watched America pull out of Afghanistan and let the country, 38 million people fall into the Taliban for the sake of 3,000 troops who weren't even in a combat situation. And so, um, you know, that's who we're dealing with right now. And that's his intention. And, and, and that is what he's thinking about. And so we don't ever want to get to that place where he's lining up his uh, tanks along the border and, and threatening us with that. 
We have some questions I want to try to get through. Uh, PK from the exchange, and, and a lot of them are related to the, to the domino, what happens next. Could you please comment on the possibility that Kazakhstan is the next domino to fall? Riots last month, Kazakhstan refusing to join Russia in the Ukraine adventure, and what that means for uranium markets. Well, Kazakhstan already fell and got picked up. It was, there was a coup in, in Kazakhstan where the um, uh, sort of puppet um, leader of Kazakhstan, this guy Tokayev, was um, was supposed to just be the puppet taking instructions from Nazarbayev, um, either engineered or took advantage of this uprising to then call the Russians in. Uh, he, he brought Russian troops in to supposedly quell the unrest, and he became the uh, new dictator. And um, uh, I don't think Kazakhstan will rise up, but but you know it's un it's uncertain who might rise up because the moment you have these commodity prices for for basic need commodities rising the way they have, anything could happen anywhere. I mean, that, that's, that's effectively why, why the um, Arab Spring took place was because of with commodity prices going up. And, and now that we're in this situation, could be Kazakhstan, could be any, anywhere at this point in time. Yeah, which is absolutely incredible. Um, Sean is asking, what is your manufacturing and trade policy if you are <coughs> detaching from China? I'm not sure um, exactly what he's referring to. Maybe he's been following you. But how does China fit into this? And do they, will they make a deal with Putin? I mean, there was an idea that they were, you know, it, it, there was some sort of, you know, at the Olympics deal mm -hmm. struck. And then pe other people have been wondering about that. Does China really want oil this high, th this much destabilization? It doesn't really fit into the the mode that that they, they prefer when they're dealing with these kind of geopolitics, uh, a, a little too messy. Um, where where do you what do you think about China's role in this? Well, China is definitely in cahoots with Putin. Um, they you know they, they uh, Xi told Putin, "Don't invade and don't don't mess up my Olympic." Spectacle, and so Putin said, "Yeah, yeah, yes, boss," because you know China really is the boss in this situation. And so, and um, uh, but they're not like partners, you know, ideological partners, and uh, you know, in any way, shape, or form, they're sort of authoritarian partners. They both want to run their authoritarian regimes. Um, they don't like democracies that respect rule of law and human rights and all that kind of stuff. And so they they share a disdain for our way of life, but. You know they're they're also adversaries in a certain way. Russia's got a lot of natural resources and and hardly any people compared to China with a lot of people and not that many natural resources. And so um, I can I can't imagine that it's pleasant for uh, the Chinese leadership to see the commodity prices rising like this because they're um, a commodity importer and that's going to cost them. But at the same time, I can imagine that they they're they're going to kind of look at this situation where Russia has no other choice if they need money but to go to China. And China loves to lend money to people on usurious terms. And so they're all licking their lips right now, thinking, what, you know, what are some good things that we want to snatch from Russia when they come to us hat in hand, uh, desperate for money? Mm. Ralph is asking, what kind of negative economic impacts do you expect Putin's war will have on neighboring Eastern European countries other than Ukraine? Well, the, the, the most important negative impact is that um, if we don't stand up to Putin properly and, and make this almost impossible to go further, um, we may not have those countries in our world anymore. They may go back into the Russian world. That's what he wants. He wants to sort of redraw the map in a way that, uh, you know, post-World War II, where he controls that whole side of the world. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that is a, um, and, and by the way, everybody, in that part of the world is is in a state of panic right now. If you're from Poland or Lithuania or Estonia, you know you're you, you're sitting there watching this thing and saying this could be me next, and and mm. it's absolutely terrifying. We have a question from Phil um, asking about certain companies or countries with heavy Russian debt in rubles that will benefit. Uh, debt reduction due to the drop in the ruble. I'm I'm not sure that's the right conclusion to come from. I mean, if you are sitting with any kind of exposure to Russia, um, what, you know, is it investable at all? Is is that, a, you know, an asset or any, is there any upside at all in any exposure to Russia? Well, I mean, so some people would argue that the price is down 98% in equities and, you know, 80 to 90% in bonds. And so anything that goes down that much should go up. But I would look at the situation first from from a moral standpoint. This is like uh, investing in 
German equities during the Holocaust. I mean, I don't think anyone, any American should be doing this. Uh, I mean, it's just wrong. Um, but it, but it, if the morality doesn't appeal to you, um, there's a, a good self-interested reason not to do it, which is that uh, it, we, we, we have effectively expropriated huge economics from Putin. And he's a guy who doesn't respect rules and doesn't respect law. I can't imagine that he's going to allow debt to be repaid by Russia to foreign creditors. Why would he? It doesn't make any sense. And nor can I imagine that he's going to allow uh, foreign equity holders to continue to hold their equity. Why not expropriate, dilute, renationalize, whatever? And so um, in these types of hostile situations, um, things can be cheap for a good reason, and they could probably get a lot, of, lot cheaper. And so even if the morality doesn't appeal to, to people, um, self-interest should. And, and there's a pretty strong argument that that uh, you know, when when all is said and done, Putin is just going to say, you know, enough of this this game of of free market capitalism. We'll just take it all for ourselves. Can how I, I was, you know, I I think we thinking can Russia Russia survive going it alone? I guess a better question is how long can they survive going along, even if they're getting, uh, you know, money at a cost from China. If they're completely cut off from the global financial system, or even cut off to the extent they are right now, what kind of time frame does Putin have to make this work for him? How can this work for him? Well, I mean, there, there's one argument it could work for a really long time. Look at North Korea. They've got it alone and, and somehow have made it all happen. On the other hand, um, you, you, you can't really do that and run this major international war um, and, and expect that they to be able to afford that major international war. You've got to pull in your horns and like, you know, really do things uh, tightly and cheaply. And so um, I don't know if there's, there, if there's an answer to that question. You know, there, the, he, he does have one other thing going for him in addition to these central bank reserves, most of which were frozen. Uh, and that is that there's not that much debt in Russia. The debt to GDP ratio is extremely low. And so to the extent that um, there is somebody who's not sort of, you know, cutting him off, uh, they might be able to argue to themselves that that he has got a he's got a good credit rating, um, although I'm not sure how they're going to argue that to themselves when he defaults on a bunch of other people, um, you know, the previous week or, or whatever that that you know scenario turns out to be. What, what, you, uh, clearly, there were there seem to be some miscalculations, uh, you know, based on what we've seen in Ukraine. And yes, it's it's early days. This is presumably presumably going to get horrible. But I'm just trying to imagine, you made the reference to North Korea, and I think a lot of people are thinking about that. But Putin doesn't seem like somebody who's, you know, willing to be a hermit king. That doesn't seem grand enough for him or, or a position that he really wants to find himself in with a populace that is suffering. I mean, he enjoyed being on the world stage and the center of it. Um, does that seem like that will be enough for him? Well, I don't think he has any choice right now. I mean, he he it's not like he can he can um, just say, okay, enough is enough. I'm, I'm going back to where I was. Forgive me. And, all, and we're going to say all is forgiven. I mean, he's killed, you know, thousands of innocent civilians. I mean, he's, you know, he, he's executed a terrorist operation, which was like 100 times worse than Osama bin Laden yeah. against the Ukrainian people. I mean, there, there's no forgiving of this whole thing. And so he's, he's made his bed now. He, you know, he used to have one foot in the civilized world, one foot in the criminal world. He's put both feet full on into the criminal world. And and now he's got to pay a price, and so I don't think that he has that much of a choice. He may not do the North Korea version, but he's going to do his version, which is cutting off all Western information. Um, they might even shut down the internet and create a Russian internet, um, so that nobody has, so it just becomes completely sealed off. And that may be the way he goes about it. I mean, it's um, that's what it looks like right now. Yeah. Which is, it's, it, it, I think this is what worries people that if he's backed into a corner and there are no good options for him. Um, that this is where the real risk comes in. Is there anyone well, who can speak to him right now? Is there anyone who has influence over him or is thinking? No, there's nobody who has influence over him. And and he's not he's not backed into a corner. He backed himself into a corner. He, we, we didn't do any of this. He did it. This is his doing. Which he makes made, it worse, maybe, in some ways. In terms it, of this, his, uh... this, but he, he did this. It's not us. And anyone who thinks that we had anything to do with it, we, we, we had nothing to do with it. He did this. And it's, it's his problem. And oh, there's people talking, I, I hate the word off-ramp. It's not our job to give him an off-ramp. It's our job to just completely emasculate him so that he can't do this anymore. And, and we should just figure out ways of doing that 
short of putting boots on the ground, at least for the moment, because we may have to do that in the future. But if we can, if we can use our financial power and our, our um, unity with other allies to just completely make it impossible for him to do anything because he has no money, that seems to be the, the best and probably only option we have at the moment. Bill, you, given what you know about Russia and the country, is there, if they were able to somehow neutralize Putin, you know, get him to step down, somehow, you know, overthrow him, whatever verb you want to use, is there an apparatus in place for someone to take over? Is there an obvious successor or somebody who could garner uh, support around him to sort of step into a leadership void? Because that's also necessary. You have to have the will to change to change the situation, but you also have to have a, a replacement of so, uh, of sorts. Well, it depends how it happens. If it's a palace coup, they'll stick some other KGB guy in there, and we'll probably have more of the same. But there's a there's a, an absolutely um, great um, leader waiting in the wings who's immensely popular, um, who has good intentions. His name is Alexei Navalny. Mm. Alexei Navalny was the um, uh, Russian opposition leader who was poisoned by Putin with Novichok in Siberia and miraculously survived. He went to Germany in a coma for a month, woke up, and when he was well enough, um, he decided even under threat of arrest to go back to Russia where he's been arrested. And he's the Nelson Mandela of Russia. And should there be a popular uprising, he's the obvious person to lead Russia out of this ugly mess. If you look at the scenarios and they're, as we started out saying, they're, they're they go from bad to to horrific. Um, what is the probability? What has the greatest probability right now in your mind? Well, in, in my mind, the uh, well, the greatest probability is that Putin um, destroys Ukraine, and then we have a um, a war with Russia on our hands. I think that's the most likely scenario, unless we get tougher with Putin than we already have been. But we've gotten tough, but we need to actually get tougher. Uh, and and I've I've read various little snippets here and there about people in the Biden administration being worried about provoking him and maybe we're being too tough. We have to be tougher. Um, now, this, uh, there's another scenario, which is if we are tougher, um, he get, could, could get caught, caught in this quagmire of Ukraine where he doesn't succeed, where he's sort of, you know, it's a, it's a frozen conflict where he, he doesn't win, they don't win, and he's sitting there doing what he's doing. Um, and in a certain way, as terrible as, as that is for Ukraine, it might be the best for the for for the Western world because it doesn't give him a chance to come to our borders. But um, uh, you know th that that's that's also likely. The least likely scenario is him saying, "Okay, enough is enough. I um, uh, I give up. Uh, you know, thank you very much," and pulls his tanks back to Russia. Mm. Todd from the RV side is asking, do you see diplomatic pressure being put on China to help influence a de-escalation? Well, I've heard that there is, but I think it's it's hugely unlikely that China is going to get involved in this. I mean, because China is waiting for their, um, you know, Russia to come with the begging bowl to um, so they can grab whatever they want of economic benefits from Russia. I don't think China, I think China also enjoys watching us squirm in this whole situation. It would it would certainly seem that way. Bill, is there an aspect we're not paying enough attention to uh, or either a risk that we're not really, I think it sounds like you think nuclear, a risk we're not really putting enough stock in or on the flip side, a positive outcome or the potential for some reason to be hopeful that, you know, we may not be again, paying enough attention to, because it's very, it's very easy to hook on. I think it feeds our fear. It's very easy to lock into these sort of worst case scenarios. But I'm just wondering when you look at that, if there's something that, or, or an aspect on this risk board that we need to be paying more attention to. And by that, I mean the game, but you, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I mean, there, there's one thing, the upside scenario. Yeah. Which I haven't talked about. That's what, the, that's what I'm asking about. Yeah. The, the, the upside scenario is that, um, uh, Russia, um, Vladimir Putin was completely overplaying his hand that his military actually can't do this, that they, they can't succeed. And that the Ukrainians, because they're fighting for their home and their freedom and their children, are just so much tougher than the Russians and they know their territory. And, I, and I've read little inklings of this. So, for example, this 40 mile 
convoy outside Kiev is stuck because the Ukrainians have blown up the bridges across various rivers, so they can't get anywhere. The Ukrainian soldiers have brutalized and killed the front of the convoy and the end of the convoy, and all the trucks are all burned out on the road, and so they can't get past it. And um, and that the Russians are cut off, their supply lines are cut off, and, and so on and so forth. And so I can imagine, and this is, I don't think it's a likely scenario when you look at the overwhelming uh, machinery and weapons that the Russians have, but you know, there's a scenario where, where the Ukrainians actually hold off the Russians and, and defeat them. That, that you know, at the end of the day, the Russians you know, burn through all their equipment and, and all their soldiers or many of their soldiers and um, and it's a, and and all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, Putin is completely, you know, destroyed, and and um, and his whole thing of being such a tough guy, his image is is completely destroyed, and 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 at that point, you know, somebody comes in and says, well, you you you've let us down this tragic and horrific road, and we want to get rid of you, and and we're going to. That's the upside scenario. I think it's low probability, but um, you know, I I read and I, I read and probably look for look for hints of that in, 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 in between the lines of all the terrible things I read to, to, to find that. But, but I, I don't think that that's what's going to happen. But, you know, we can all hope and pray that that happens. Yeah, I've been looking for those same <laughs> for those same lines and glimmers of hope, um, given all that we're talking about. And it's difficult. I, I think we can end on this, though. And the one thing that we don't talk about a lot, we're talking about the weaponization of the financial system, the economic war that we're basically in already to try to prevent a conventional war. What about the information war? We know they've cut off the Internet. We know other you know, uh, all sorts of tech companies have pulled out uh, of servicing the Russian people. Um, but, you know, they're, we, we've seen the sort of power as they're driving in of invading a country that speaks their language um, and the people directly are appealing to the soldiers um, in a very civilian tone. Um, what about that? You know, what, what about efforts to sort of uh, kind of wage an infor information war? C can information get into Russia? Are there back channels? Are there ways um, to try to push on that front? Well, he, he's he's making it as hard as possible for us to do that because he's gotten rid of every single independent media source. He's cut out um, all the, you know, BBC and CNN and Radio Free Europe and all the all the places where people would get honest, objective information. Cut out, you know, TikTok is no longer there. And yeah, I was thinking even in the even in the in the age of social media, we're seeing even TikTok is shattered. Yes. It's it's all getting shut down, and so and then he's busy blasting his narrative across all of the remaining information portals, so that the Russian people have a completely um, distorted view of what's going on. And um, you know, will that be? Uh, is that permanent? Um, you know, eventually, you know, people whose children were sent to war are going to come back, or they're going to come back in coffins. Although they, they the, having said that, they they have. They have uh, they brought crematoriums, moving crematoriums to just destroy the bodies so that, that no one's ever going to know what happened to a lot of these soldiers. But still, you know, people aren't going to come back from the war and, and stories will come back and and information will spread. And um, hopefully that will get through to people. But right now, the Russians all think that this is a peacekeeping operation that, mm -hmm. that's being run in Ukraine. And, and I've heard stories of you know, split families, half in Ukraine, half in Russia, where the people in Ukraine are telling their Russian, like a, a daughter is telling her mother, we're being bombed. And the mother said, that's impossible. I'm watching the news and that's not going on. Yeah. Um, One has to wonder in this information technology age we live in, when everyone has a smart, smartphone in their hand and a computer in their hand, though, how long you can keep that veil of misinformation down. Um, and maybe well, that's the other well, area that we can look to with hope. Look at the United States. We have full access to information and, and Half, yeah, half the country believes one thing and half the country believes another thing. So why is it be any different in Russia? Yeah, it's a very good point. Bill, I, I keep hoping that one day we're going to end one of these conversations uh, on an up note. Um, but unfortunately, it's a situation we find ourselves in. But we appreciate you coming on and sharing your insight and your you know, in-depth knowledge of the workings of Vladimir Putin um, and his mind. Um, I hope the next time that you come on, it can be a, under better circumstances. But we sure appreciate it. Well, maybe we can celebrate a Ukrainian victory next time. But, yeah, um, here's, here's hoping, and, and we're going to need a lot of that. 
Um, thank you so much. Thanks for all the great questions uh, and for all of you to watch for watching. Uh, Tony Greer is going to be here hosting Warren Pies. You know it's going to be fantastic watching the commodity market, and he'll have a lot more information on these huge moves we're seeing. I know we had a question about <laughs> aluminum. We'll, I'm sure Tony will cover that tomorrow, so be sure to tune in. Uh, and Rao is going to be here on Friday. Uh, he'll put a lot more flesh on the bone about what he's thinking, and I'm sure he's going to talk about what it means for cryptocurrencies as well, their role in all of this. He'll be here on Friday, March 11th, so be sure to tune in to that as well. Uh, in the meantime, take care and good luck out there. Uh -huh.